country music at first influenced me. I mean, everybody did. I mean, I was just, it was music for me. You know, my mother died when I was 11. And I had already been very attracted to music. And, and really, I watched Elvis in 1956 on Ed Sullivan. I, I was there in front of a black and white TV, like mesmerized as a very young fellow. Uh, when my mother died, when I was 11 uh, in 1959, I turned to music big time. That was my, that's my place. That's where I went. And um, that's when I became really serious. So I've always listened to whatever's going on. A lot of country hits, man. I could play them all. That's how I learned to play guitar. Listen to, you know, Tennessee Ernie Ford or, 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 or all of those great, great artists from back in the day, you know, El Paso and all those songs. Um, you know? Marty Robbins is amazing. Marty Robbins, like unbelievable. Unbelievably good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Incredible. Died too young, you know, cancer. Yeah. But anyway, anyway. And, and so and, many and, albums. That guy had a lot of output. Holy smokes. Yeah. Yeah. We play Marty Robbins a lot of that. And car, when we go on road trips and stuff, we have his CDs, the greatest of and all that. We're big fans, my partner and I. So anyway, um, and then the Beatles, of course, with the British invasion, then I loved everything British, everything from the Rolling Stones to the Beatles to everybody else, Dave Clark Five to you name it. Yeah. Uh, and then, of course, in, into Zeppelin, things started getting heavy. Albums started being made, from, yeah. you know. And back then, uh, I was subjected to everybody. Everybody was just, a, it was like a sponge. Now, I gotta, have, I gotta ask you something, and and it has to do with the chronological. Uh, member changes in the band when you when I mean April Wine first started when you first broke let's say when you first broke uh, there was was it was it two brothers in the band with you yeah that was uh, David and Richie Henman yeah okay yeah, and, and now did you not just did you not mention David earlier saying he wrote a song that you just did yeah drop your guns okay okay yeah. so so the, the two Henman brothers what did they play well David was a guitar player did some singing and Richie was the drummer. Okay. And who was the bass player at that point? Their cousin, Jim Henman. Oh, wow. Davey, so that... David, David Henman, Richie Henman, brothers, cousin, Jim Henman. Wow. And myself, and then, the four of us. And then he and you. And so that lasted for what, three, four albums? It lasted to the middle of uh, the whole was going crazy. Whole electric, electric jewels. Electric jewels. That makes sense. Okay. And, uh, and I wasn't happy. Uh, I wasn't happy. And so um, I replaced uh, Richie with uh, Jerry Mercer. Uh, from Mash McCann. Yeah, from Mash McCann. And when I, when I contacted him, he was in New York with um, uh, the master of the, the master of the Telecaster, um, uh, the blues guy there. Uh, oh, Buchanan? Yeah. Roy. Roy he became. played with Roy, really? He was he was with Roy at that time. He was doing a tour and a little bit of recording. Wow. So so I got a hold of him and I said, I need a drummer for April Wine, you know, to go where I want to go musically. The thing about Richie, and this is all in my book. I mean, you know, and and and, and Richie and I are still in, in, in contact. Like he wasn't a serious musician. I mean, I am still. Mm -hmm. That's what I live for. I live for music. And every day it's about music. Every day. I get up and, and, and my, I'm wrapped up in a guitar for the time I'm having my first coffee. That's almost every day. So, I mean, I've got I've got albums written and backed up. I mean, I got the, my next blues album's all written anyway. I'm getting off track. So he was he did he's not like that, and I knew he wasn't like that. So I had to replace him, and um, and he got into a uh, into a job and spent the rest of his life doing something that he was excellent at, very very good at, and so he, he was in the right place. Yeah. So and, and so no, Richie, no harm, no harm done. No harm done. So then, so Jerry joined me, an incredible drummer, uh, you know, and one, one of the greatest I've ever seen and heard. Yeah. Yeah. Like people talk about Neil Peart. They talk about Jerry Mercer in the same breath. Yeah, you know? I agree. I agree. And uh, and of course, Jerry's still alive. He just celebrated a birthday, what, three weeks ago, I think. And so I'm 74. Uh, I'm 73 right now, but I'm 74 in June on my birthday on the 23rd. And we, he's nine years older. He's actually 10 years old, older for a couple of months because his birthday's in May, mine's in June. So, but he's still around. He doesn't play anymore. But, you know, he just to so show fans out there that you know that he's, he's still alive and he's well. You know? I was going to ask you, and I, I assume he's probably well, uh, but just retired. My, one of the things that surprised me about Jerry, though, was how late he came to the game playing drums. 
Why do you say that? I remember reading in a book some, somewhere where he didn't start playing until he was in his 20s. Oh, it could be. I, I don't know about that. I know he was always, uh, he loved music as well. He sang in the choir and all kinds of things like that, like I did. Uh, and Jerry has a very good ear musically. Like we did a version of 21st century schizoid man, a guitar version of a song that belonged to King Crimson way back right. in the day. I think, it was, I think it was harder, faster. And I had always wanted to do it since because I got that first Court of the Crimson King by them. And the song was there. And I said, I really want to do this one day. So years go by. And then I said, okay. But it was Mercer, some of the really complicated, some of that stuff that's syncopated and really, he worked it on the piano in the studio because we were going like, no, what's it doing there anyway? You know, and it was Jerry. He has a good ear. Wow. So he would sit down and figure, no, this is it here. There's okay. There's the harmony on another song. He, he, he was good that way. That came from his church upbringing. Well, you know, I, it's funny you say that about him being musical, because I played a version of the other day when I was knowing you were going to be on the show. And I remember I looked at, I was listening to the live album that came out back then. And, and he had that little cut of his own called Good Fibes, right? Yeah, he did a drum solo. I said, Jerry, give it a name. You'll get yeah. some royalties. <laughs> but it was, what I'm going to say is it was so musical what he was playing. Those drums were playing melodies. It wasn't just chops. You know, it was it is, like that's what made his drum solo so freaking good, not just the show. Absolute, absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. And the drums are called vibes too. You know, the drums vibes, are called yeah, yeah, vibes, yeah. yeah, good vibes. So uh, no, I mean, I can't listen to a drum solo. I hear people do drum solos on the road with touring something, got to bring us into it, and they're just like, you know, yeah. Net but network Jerry, time, network time killers. But Jerry, my God, it all has form and it develops and does this and it does that and syncopations and it's just like. What, it's a piece of music. It's a, it's beautiful, and he did it like no other. I'm sure there are other drummers that had incredible drum solos too, but he was definitely one of them, wasn't he? I did enjoy Mick Fleetwood's drum solo with Fleetwood Mac because it brought him out. You could he, he can be quite a comedian, so he's almost he was. It almost made him a front man for that piece. You know, it wasn't mm -hmm. so much what he played; it was how he played it and the way he dealt with the uh, he dealt with the audience and brought them into it. Okay, which was I don't fun. know. Yeah, that was fun. Yeah. But yeah. no, Jerry, by far best drum solo ever in the history of my life. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you on that one. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and, and at the same time, when David left the band in the, in the, in the middle of Electric Jewels, uh, I brought in Gary Moffat, who we had known. He lived in Montreal and, uh, and he was in a band called Pops Merrily. Oh, okay. And he's a student of, uh, of the American Songbook. So he... There's solos on April Wine Records that are just absolutely outstanding. And, and the best of them are him. You know, uh, not that Brian Greenway and myself didn't play decent solos, but Gary's were spectacular. Uh, if you listen to, I mean, I don't know if, you, if people watching this would know the songs or not, but a song like, uh, well, You Won't Dance With Me, mm -hmm. actually, is very orchestrated with harmonies and they divide and they do this whole thing. And um, uh, um, Mama Lay, which is a very Caribbean driven kind of thing about this voodoo lady, the solo in that. So many times, you know, what would happen is I'd have a song and I'd say, you know, Gary, you want to, you want to do the solo on this one? He goes, sure. So he'd take it home and he'd work it all out. And then he would come back to the studio and with two versions. And we would sit there and listen to his two versions that were complete with harmonies and counter melodies and like this whole incredible thing. And we just be blown away. So yeah, let's do that. You know, it's remarkable. Hey, thanks for joining us. Check out our other vignettes and full episodes from a wide variety of guests for more great content. Please like, share, and subscribe. And become a member at socialenergypresents.com to access premium content and earn valuable energy points just for watching.